Welcome back. The ACT science section is sort of its own strange animal. If you're anything like me, then after you finish reading one of the science passages, your immediate reaction might be something like, what the hell was that? <laughs> and if that sounds at all familiar, then you're in the right place. In this video, we'll talk about some of the best tips and tricks to help you understand the ACT science section. You can often answer many of the questions, even if you didn't understand a single thing from the passage. My students really like this one. I hope you do as well. And if you do, just take a second and hit that like button. Go ahead, just smash it, just turn it blue, did, got it, thank you, okay. And of course, be sure to subscribe to the channel where you could find other great tips and tricks for the SAT and the ACT. As always, I thank you for your support. Okay, here are some great tricks to help you on the ACT science section. We'll start with some easier questions and then we'll kick it up a notch to get to some harder examples. So before we start, let's just talk for a second about what makes the ACT science section a little challenging. The questions in this section are not like those from your high school science class. Most ACT science questions are not based on specific scientific facts that you could study beforehand. Instead, they're based on scientific reasoning and interpreting data from experiments. The problem is that the experiments could be a little hard to understand, but you can still answer many of the questions, even if you're totally stumped by the passage. How? Let's take a look. Question one. What is the fuel efficiency rating for an HIQ hybrid car driving 30 miles per hour? So let's just take a second to acclimate ourselves to this data. They're giving us the fuel efficiency rating for three different types of cars, and it's showing us what happens to each rating as the car goes faster and faster and faster. This question is as transparent as it seems. It's asking for the fuel efficiency rating for the HIQ car at 30 miles per hour. All you have to do is go to the HIQ column and read the number from the row of 30 miles per hour. The answer is C, 61. So for many types of science questions, all you have to do is just read the data. Many of my students often think that the science questions are doing something far more complicated than this. They're not. Just read the data. That's it. You can answer these questions very easily, even if you didn't understand anything from the passage. Now, as you read the data, you want to think about what story it's telling. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the numbers in this table a little more carefully. The column on the left indicates driving speed. What happens to each column of efficiency rating as the car goes faster and faster and faster? Well, let's look at that first column. The numbers go up, and then somewhere around 60 miles per hour, they peak and then go down. And then the same trend is continued in each column. In each column, the numbers go up, peak around 60 miles per hour, and then dip off. They're giving us a very clear trend in each column. So, as you analyze the given data, look for trends or patterns. Now sometimes there is no trend, but if there is one, it'll be very clear, like we just saw here. And those trends will help you on the next two types of questions. Question two, what is the estimated fuel efficiency for a TES electric car driving 100 miles per hour? So they wanna know what's happening at 100 miles per hour in that last column. However, the table only gives us data up until 90 miles per hour. But look at what's happening in that last column. After the TES car peaks at 91, the fuel efficiency rating continues to dip. 85, 79, 74. You are allowed to continue that trend to 100 miles per hour. If that trend continued, the efficiency rating would continue to dip a bit. So the answer is J, less than 74. So another popular science question wants you to project the data beyond the scope of the graph. In other words, you are allowed to assume that any trend in the data will continue past the point where a chart, graph, or table ends. And this relates to the next type of question as well. Question three, what is the estimated fuel efficiency for a TPR compact car driving 25 miles per hour? So let's look at that TPR column and see what the numbers tell us. At 10 miles per hour, the car has a rating of 42. At 20 miles per hour, the rating is 48. And at 30 miles per hour, the rating is 53. The numbers continue to trend upwards for this part of the table. So if the question's asking what the rating would be at 25 miles per hour, you are allowed to assume that the rating would fall right between the numbers for 20 and 30 miles per hour. So the answer is B, between 48 and 53. So in another type of science question, you can also interpret data between two points on a graph. 
In other words, you are allowed to assume that any trend in the data will be consistent between two given values of a graph, table, or chart. Now, notice how we were able to answer all three of these questions without even looking at an actual passage. So if you find yourself completely confused after reading a science passage, don't psych yourself out. You'll still be able to answer many of the questions. Let's look at another. This next tip is one that my students really like. For the upcoming question, don't worry about picking a correct answer. It's not possible without showing you a passage. But think about which two answers are kind of silly. Question four. If a car's driver blah 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 blah, which of the following would be true? Blah 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 blah, because as the car increases its speed, it'll go faster. Blah 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 blah, because as a car increases its speed, it'll go slower. Blah 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 blah, because as the car decreases its speed, it'll go faster. And blah 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 blah, because as the car decreases its speed, it'll go slower. Hopefully, two of those answers jumped out to you as a little strange. Let's take a closer look at G and H. In G, it says as the car increases its speed, it'll go slower. That doesn't make sense. If it's increasing its speed, it has to go faster. Same thing in H. As the car decreases its speed, it'll go faster. Also, doesn't make sense. So even without reading the passage, you would know that these two answers would be out of the running. They just don't make sense. It would have to be F or J. So in another type of science question, you could use what I call common sense elimination. For certain questions, two answers are simply illogical. You can often eliminate them just based on reasoning. So just to give another example, they might ask what happens to the mass of a certain object as it loses or gains material. There might be an answer choice that says something like, as the object increases in mass, it loses material. That doesn't make sense. Or they could also say it will decrease in mass as it gains material. That also doesn't make sense. So again, who cares what you read in the passage? Common sense will often tell you that two answers are immediately out. Now, that's not always enough to get down to a final answer, but it does help you get down to a one out of two shot instead of a one out of four shot. Think about what choices you can eliminate based on common sense alone. Okay, now we're warmed up. Now let's see how these tips and tricks can show up on some harder questions. So here's the table that we'll need for the next few questions. Remember, before we even look at the questions, we want to think about what story the data is telling us, so to speak. So I'll give you a second. Press pause and think about any trends that you could spot in this data. So just to familiarize ourselves with this table, they're giving us different types of stars, O, B, A, all the way to M. And as we read the table from left to right, all of the numbers get smaller. The radius decreases, 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 and the same is true with mass, temperature, and luminosity. In other words, all of these factors will increase at the same time or decrease at the same time. That's a very clear trend. Let's see how that could now help us on a question. Question five. Scientists are always trying to find planets that could potentially sustain human life. This means that the planet must orbit a star that is not too hot, but also not too cold. Scientists refer to this as the Goldilocks zone. Stars are in the Goldilocks zone if their temperature raises from 4300 degrees to 6800 degrees. Which of these spectral types are potentially in the Goldilocks zone? I'll give you a second. Press pause. Give it a try. So the question's asking about a temperature between 4300 and 6800. Where do you see that in the chart? Stars K, G, and F all have numbers that would fall in that range. So the answer is B. K, G, and F. Like we saw before, this question just wanted you to read the data. No need to overthink the questions like this. Let's look at another. Question six. Scientists have discovered a star with a radius of 7.6 sun units and a mass of 38 sun units. What is the best estimate of its temperature? I'll give you a second. Press pause and try to answer. So let's see where those numbers fall on the given table. 7.6 would be right between the radius of 10 and 5. That's those first two columns. Also, the mass of 38 would fall right between 50 and 10, also between those first two columns. That means that this star would live somewhere between spectral types O and B. We are therefore allowed to assume that its temperature would also fall in that range. So we know it has to be between 40,000 and 20,000. The answer is J. 
Again, you are allowed to interpret data between two points on a graph. Now, don't answer the next question. Just think about which two choices would definitely be wrong. Question seven. Astronomers have found blah, 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 blah. Which of the following is a reasonable conclusion? As a brown dwarf becomes a white dwarf, its temperature will increase because it gets colder over time, increase because it gets warmer over time, decrease because it gets colder over time, or decrease because it gets warmer over time. There are two answers here that just don't make sense. Hopefully A and D stuck out to you as sort of weird. To say that the temperature will increase because it gets colder, that's counterintuitive. Same thing with D. It doesn't make sense to say that the temperature will decrease because it gets warmer. So, even without seeing the passage, you know that A and D are out. You're down to B and C. Now, in order to pick the right answer between B and C, then of course, you'd have to understand whatever the passage said about brown dwarves and white dwarves. But if you're in a pinch, this is a great trick to help you knock out two of the choices. Now let's make things a little harder. Let's say that this next graph also came along with the passage. So just to look at what it's measuring, the y-axis is measuring lifespan and the x-axis is measuring mass. And what story is the data telling? Well, as the mass continues to go up along the x-axis, the lifespan goes down. In other words, the bigger a star is, the shorter its lifespan will be. The graph will start to plateau after a while. Let's see how this relates to the next question. Question eight, what is the estimated lifespan of a spectral type B star? This one's a little harder. I'll give you a second. Press pause, give it a try. Notice what the second graph is doing. It's relating lifespan to mass. So in order to determine lifespan in the second picture, we need to look at mass in the first picture. In that table, a spectral type B star has a mass of 10. And let's see how that now relates to the second graph. Notice that the x-axis of the second graph goes from 0 to 2.8, but we now have a star with a mass of 10. Just like we saw before, we can project beyond the scope of the graph. So, a star with a mass of 10 would be much further to the right along the x-axis. And if that was the case, what would happen to the lifespan? It would continue to plateau as the graph continues. That would correspond to a y value less than 25 billion. The answer is j. So this brings up a harder type of question to look out for. Think about how the data from one graph can affect the data from another graph. That's a little harder, so let's think about another variation. Say that another question wanted you to relate lifespan to luminosity. How could you do that even though they're not being measured on the same graph? Again, mass is the key variable that we need to think about. How do mass and luminosity relate? Well, remember what we said about the data in that first table. Mass and luminosity will both go up together or they'll both go down together. So we could say that as the mass increases, so will the luminosity. And now we can tie that into the second graph. As the mass increases, the lifespan decreases. And we can infer that the same thing would be true about luminosity. A higher luminosity would mean a higher mass, which would mean a lower lifespan. Or vice versa, a lower luminosity would mean a lower mass, which would mean a higher lifespan. These are some harder questions for sure. So again, try to determine how data from one graph affects the data in another graph. Let's try one more. Question nine. Scientists hypothesize that spectral type M stars are too small to contain gas giants in their orbit. Their gravity can only contain terrestrial planets. If this were true, which planets in our solar system could potentially orbit a spectral type M star? The key word here is terrestrial. Only the first four planets in our solar system are terrestrial. The others are gas giants. So the answer is A, Mercury, Earth, and Mars. All of the other choices list at least one of the gas giants. Now, in order to answer that question, you actually had to know a little bit of science. Again, most science questions will not require any outside knowledge. Everything you need to know can usually be found somewhere in the passage. However, a small handful of questions will require you to have at least some familiarity with a few basic scientific concepts. So another type of question to look out for are those that ask about actual scientific knowledge. So the good news for these questions is that they let you sidestep the passage, so to speak. You can often answer them without understanding the actual passage. But the bad news is that, well, you need to know the actual science fact that they're asking. Unfortunately, there is no master list of every science fact that is fair game on the ACT. Sometimes they'll be asking something very basic, like knowing that an acid has a lower pH than a base, 
or knowing that the charge of a proton is positive while the charge of an electron is negative. But sometimes they might throw in a harder topic, like balancing a chemical equation. Check out my upcoming science video, where I'll include a great cheat sheet for what science topics have crept into the test in recent years. I'll put the link here. And let's end with a few more quick tips. Some other hints for the science section. When you're down to just a few minutes left, answer any quick graph reading questions. In other words, don't worry about the questions dealing with comprehension or understanding why the scientist did something a certain way. Try to rack up on any quick remaining points of just reading a chart or reading a graph. Also, for many passages, the questions will get harder as you go. This is not a hard and fast rule, but usually, in the span of six or seven science questions for a passage, the first few, usually, deal with those data interpretation questions, and then the last few use a little more critical thinking. So make sure to get those towards the beginning that just want you to read the data. And if you're particularly pressed for time, do the conflicting viewpoints passage last. This is the passage where they'll compare and contrast how different scientists or students feel about a certain hypothesis. We'll cover more strategies for the conflicting viewpoints passage in an upcoming video. I'll be putting the link here. So these are some of the best tips and tricks to help you navigate the ACT science passages. Now, don't get me wrong. There are, of course, several questions where you'll have to understand the actual passage, but for many, you won't. So don't psych yourself out. If you're totally lost after reading the passage, that's okay. You can still answer many questions by just looking at the data, spotting trends, eliminating some choices based on common sense, and drawing from a few outside scientific facts. My students really like these strategies. I hope you do as well. And if you do, hit that like button, leave a comment down below, and be sure to subscribe and share the video. Thanks for watching. And remember, plan your work, work your plan.